Right now we have uh, Lene. Lene is a filmmaker uh, and she also owns her own real estate company, which is located in North New Jersey. Uh, Jules Real Estate Company, which also has an office out of Montclair, New Jersey, and she's also a broker. We have the wonderful Rain, who's our intern turned producer her last year at Bloomfield College. Um, Rain is a multimedia communications director. We have a guest host this evening, the wonderful Ra Digga. Ra Digga is a iconic hip hop artist, actress, writer, she also has her own show that she hosts. And uh, Lene is going to take it away and introduce our guests. Absolutely. First of all, hello, everyone. I hope you, everyone's doing well. Today, we are so honored and blessed to have um, an inspiration to Stevie Wonder. Need I say more? This brother is Stevie Wonder's inspiration. Talam Acey is a child of the Newark Rebellion, raised by a single mother who served as a member of the famed writer and activist Amal Amiri Baraka's community organization. Acey is an independent artist whose work has been featured frequently on TV One as well as the documentary channel and was selected as the original number one thing you need to know about on BET's countdown show, The Five. Over the years, BET has featured and aired roughly a dozen segments featuring Talam AC. The Newark, New Jersey native's poetry has appeared in Essence Magazine and Susan Taylor, the magazine's editor emeritus personally invited AC to perform for an audience of 6,000 at the Essence Music Festival in New Orleans. AC was a curator of the 2012 Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival, the largest poetry gathering in North America, and was selected as the initial presenter for the inaugural Baltimore TEDx. He has numerous awards and honors, uh, but I would like to say um, he has recorded more than 16 CDs and authored seven books. Additionally, films that include his work have garnered audience award for in 2002 and a special jury prize in 2006 at the Sundance Film Festival. He uh, was featured in an acclaimed Radio One London Slam Poetry Documentary, and Mark Smith, the founder of the Slam Poetry, used AC's work in his definitive book. Talam currently resides in Los Angeles, California. We are so privileged to be in the presence of this beautiful, brilliant mind, and I am looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm privileged, I'm privileged to be a part of it. Thanks for the invite and thanks for the welcome. You're most definitely. How are you and how have you been coping with the pandemic? Um, my life hasn't changed much. I haven't heard the whole biography read like in a long time. So I was just thinking about the years and those were years, a lot of the years your name were years I was really active. So I'd say for the last several years, I've been, I don't know, I'm, I thought the whole point was to, at some point, be able to chill. <laughs> so the last several years I've been chilling and I, I hold time more important than anything. It's the, it's the most important asset that I think that I have. Um, the COVID, um, by the grace of God, hasn't changed my life much because I was already a homebody and I wasn't, you know, I was already just reading and, and watching and learning. You know, so um, it, it hasn't changed my life much, uh, you know, for what it's worth, except that it, of course, an, an elevated concern for everyone that's going through uh, a rougher time than they would have if it hadn't been for this situation. Absolutely. Are you able to write or anything? Have you been able to write and create during this time? Um, I have done some writing, uh, not a lot. In the in the term in terms of the question, the, the basic question, are you able to write always? I can always write. 
I never force it though. So there are some writers who um, they believe they have the belief that you have to write something every day. And I'm fine that that's their belief. It's not mine. I, I feel like I should only write when I'm inspired. So when, when I really feel like I have something to say, and it could be, it, it, it could be composed of parts and parcels of things I've been thinking about for the last year. And then finally, it's time for them to all come together into, into a, a piece. But if it takes a year, you know, I'm fine with it. I don't feel like I have to write every day or every month, you know? I think uh, Rain, um, you have something you want to ask? Yes. Um, to jump in, guys. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask, how did you get into poetry? Like, was there a specific moment or like event that drew you in? You got the, because of the angle of your camera and those white um, lines behind you, you got this whole like presence of God thing going. <laughs> like, I feel like you're looking down from the heavens, you know, it's, a, it's what's up. Could you repeat that question? <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> No. Um, so I wanted to know, how did you get into poetry? Like, was there a specific moment or like event that drew you in? Yeah, there's two, two sides to that. The first is I was raised on it. My mother and my father were part of Amiri Baraka. Amamu means teacher, right? So Amamu Amiri Baraka's uh, organization called the Community for a Unified Nook. So this was back in the, in the 60s, uh, the late 60s and early 70s. So I was born in 70 and raised within you know, that organization, my first footsteps taken in his house, so on and so forth. So poetry has always been with me. First books that I read, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, um, Langston Hughes, uh, Dudley Randall, County Cullens, you know, Sonic Claude McKay. Those were the books that were around. Those were, that was what my mother would read for bedtime stories, you know. And when I started reading, that's what I was reading. So poetry has been with me forever. Um, spoken word came, um, it was, you know, I, I saw like people starting to do it, like when the Apollo and, and Jessica Caremore was winning, and she won like five times. I'm like, oh, okay, now we can do poetry again. So it was bringing me back to my roots because at the time I was still like dabbling and seeing and things like that back in, in that time. So when I saw it uh, branching out, I wanted to get back into it. Then I saw like Love Jones was, was cool, but it wasn't the type of scene for me, you know? And a friend of mine, and I we used to do, we used to throw parties, uh, you know, to be candid. It was like, you know, men's parties, like the equivalent of bachelor parties without the bachelor, you know, so called the lockdowns. And we were doing that and with a friend of mine. And uh, I, I wanted to support other things that he was doing, other shows he was doing. I missed one, which was his birthday. And he said, make it up to me, come to this. And it was his poetry night. And I thought it was going to be Love Jones, like people snapping their fingers and, you know, everybody all cool and supportive. And what it ended up being was on William Street and Maine in East Orange was a spot called Bogies. And man, it was just, it was everything that Essex County, you know, was back in those days. You know, it was just hardcore. Like you couldn't stumble on a poem and expect a whole lot of support from the crowd. People have been working all week. They only came because their girl wanted to come. They spent their hard-earned money to get in. It wasn't a lot, five, 10 bucks at the door, but that was enough. They done bought drinks. You better be entertaining. You know what I mean? So it was my cup of tea. You know, it was like entertain me or else type stuff, you know? And, I, and that was what I, I dug that, you know? Um, so I went there and the first time, the first couple of casts that got up, I wanted to get up, but I, had, I didn't have a spoken word piece. And it started to like, kill me. Like I was sitting there. I wanted to get on the mic and just start talking off the top of my head, you know, and which I'm a Virgo. We don't do that. It's all got to be planned out and thought, you know, so I left, man. I sat in the car and started writing forms in my head for the next show, you know, which was going to be in two weeks. And I, I stayed out there so long. I started seeing the people file out because the show was ending, you know, start seeing the, the, the cars clear out the parking lot, but I'm still sitting there writing my poems. And I did that every day until the next show came, you know, and and and, and it's, the rest was history. I just fell in love with it. It was it was a there was a time we used to use that we used to use sexy as an adjective for other than intimacy or sex, right? Which just just sexy just meant appealing. It was just super appealing, you know. I had my twenty first birthday party at Bogies. <laughs> yeah, you know, Ruben. Um, unfortunately. 
uh, is no longer with us. It seemed like he went mm-hmm. through had their own bogeys. Uh, his father used to own like that whole block back in the, you know, like Miss Stewart, how she had Miss Stewart's in York, and then like her son had John's place down mm-hmm. there. Yeah, so in that same thing, right. like, the, the Peppermint, the family that ran the Peppermint, it was like they were one of those families, and the son owned bogeys, you know, and um, something happened uh, domestically, and, and he just he didn't make it. Matter of fact, his his him his his I think wife and his child they all didn't make it. Unfortunately, not not to be down, but it's just something that hits me hard because back in those days, that cat who seemed to have everything going for him, including a father in his life. And, you know, he's our age running a club. And I don't know, it just seemed like, it just teaches you a, a lesson that life is just hard, no matter you know what the angle, what the finances, what the social ties, you know? Right on. Um, let me ask you this. <clears throat> With everything going on now, like the just the whole racial tensions and, and climate and things of that nature. I mean, I know this, this isn't anything new. If, if you you know, if you were here in the 60s, 70s, like this is all just another day in, in our story. Does, <clears throat> do you, uh, what do you say to, I guess, to, to younger people that are trying to like consume what's going on right now? And like, how do you, how do you explain to them that this is, you know, this is America and, and, and what are some of the things, uh, or I guess coping mechanisms that you would, would give to, to younger people? I'll be honest with you. Um, there, there are certain things that have happened that had they happened to me and my family, I don't know that I could have coped with them as well as some of the people that they um, have on television, you know, and, and with the, on the podiums who are very forgiving. You know, I, I think of when um, Joan died in Texas by the white, when the white cop, uh, lady cop shot him, said she went into the wrong apartment, uh, which, you know, of course, is one of those ridiculous things like mistaking your gun for your taser, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's insulting. Right. Uh, how how right. His, brother, his brother was like hugging her and the judge was, you I just know, want to hug, give her a hug. Like, huh? Yeah, yeah we were all befuddled. Yeah, so I ain't, I ain't, um, I don't know. I was I was raised in Newark in Essex County, right? Because started in Newark. I went to whew, started in Newark daycare to Chaz School to um, I went up to Orange to Orange High for two years, and then I finished in St. Benedict's Prep on High Street, Martin Luther King Boulevard. Um, went to Essex County College, NJIT, Rutgers. Every college Newark had to offer. You know, went to all mm-hmm. that. I was raised in a time, I, re, I was raised with cats who fought cops and security guards, period. The, and you ain't had to hurt their kid. You know, <laughs> you, you didn't have, they didn't have no kids for you to hurt. They just fought on principle. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know how well, based on the time and place I was raised, I could deal with some of that. But I think if I was talking to a young cat, what I would tell them is I was also raised in a time and place where we knew how to move. So we knew what was what before it ever happened. We knew when it was time to leave the party an hour before something went wrong. You know, we knew how to move. And I, I think that's a science that, that, need, that deserves more attention, you know, in terms of um, how, we, how, how we move. And you, you just got to keep it together. I don't know about the turn the other cheek, but I do know that everything should be strategic. I do know you shouldn't do anything uh, simply out of anger. You shouldn't lunge out and that anything you, you do, you should have a plan. And with every plan, there is, um, there is an objective that's optimal and an objective that's suboptimal. And you have to realize that sometimes, you know, if, if you're going to make a move, you have to realize that um, it may not go your way. It's like when, when we back in the day, they say, you know, don't do the crime if you can't do the time, you know, um, if you know, um, that you are, you have it in your heart to forgive someone and and, and just take it uh, the regular route. I think you should go that route. But I right. think that if you're a person that might explode, don't think you're alone because there are other people who who wouldn't know how to handle those situations or would handle them um, very aggressively. 
<laughs> and keep it off social media, whatever you do. <laughs> like, oh yeah, my yeah, goodness. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Um, before we go into more questions, Lene, I wanted you to just play a clip of one of his poems. We, um, Talam, is it, uh, we had a piece that you did some years ago um, with you talking about um, Mark, um, young brother that, uh, the killing of Mike Brown. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Lene is gonna go to that. Um, the, When I was in high school, I used to hang out all night on Park Avenue in Spanish Harlem with my boy DC. And one night, I made it back home to New Jersey in just enough time to miss that last number 24 bus. And I didn't know what to do, so I called up my mom's and she was like, sorry you felt like you had to wake me up. <laughs> I hope you make it home safely. I love you. Good luck. <laughs> And from the moment I hung up the receiver, it was on. I had to make it four and a half miles up Central Avenue through Newark, East Orange and Orange. And it's like the movie The Warriors was playing through my mind. And I figured there was a 50-50 chance I would survive. And I kept envisioning all types of crazy motherfuckers jumping from the alleys and stoops with baseball bats and brass knuckles and chains and knives. But eventually, by the grace of God, I made it home just fine. Now, now my mother did what a lot of mothers would have done back in those circumstances in those times. But, but these times... These here times is different. In these times, if your young black child call you in the middle of the night, you might want to wake that ass up, get dressed, and go get him. Otherwise, you may have just spoken to the next law enforcement harassment victim. In, in these times of Black Lives Matter, where the souls of black folks are scattered with the dreams and hopes of dusky mothers and grandmothers who themselves could become the next Eleanor bumpers with them two shotgun blasts. And alas, if your gifted and talented honorable student great candidate for scholarships finds herself in the crosshairs of the wrong cop, look, moms and pops, I'm not sure her exemplary demeanor or her stellar report card will be able to get her out of it. Nah, she might as well have on that limited edition Easy e fuck the police t-shirt with that red, black, and green jacket and blazing on the back with Sandra Bland, smoking a cigarette, holding up the middle finger on both hands. It's like the cops creep up to your child wearing a sick-ass smile, listening to their favorite slow jam. The program ain't changed from Oscar Grant to Freddie Gray with that din 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 and still Freddie's dead even though we've been cutting 12 inches that represent the 12 bullets that was put into little Bobby Hutton cause ain't nothing new under the sun it's just these days the phrase Black Lives Matter has become a rallying cry for cops some of whom believe they can't justify their self-worth unless they prove Black Lives Matter not got a Mike Brown hands up man down cover up Black Lives Matter, and immediately before and after death, some of us get to hang out at the bar with Sean Bell, we get to sip shots of Flint, Michigan water, and, and smoke cartons of Eric Garner cigarettes. Ain't no true right of action for black men and black women whose very names have been reduced to action words. In other words, they will snatch you out of that Bentley Benz or Beamer, and your upwardly mobile ass will commence to getting the aloe kinged or lawema They got euthanasia tasers, beat them silly billy clubs and kill a nigga trigger fingers. The thing is, they on that Laquan McDonald's skag. They addicted to them black bodies and black body bags. Got them, got them nodding off, got them tapping that arm and, and, and put them in the zone. They could, they could die in their sleep. They on that Ayanna Monet, Stanley Jones, it's coming down. Cue the last poets. Jones coming down. Daybreak, Jones coming down. Got the shakes. Jones coming down, nose running, joint dripping, mind slipping, body aches. They say it's impossible to convince a man that what he's doing is evil when his very livelihood depends on him doing it. They say if I bring up the need to address black on black murder within the context of Black Lives Matter, that would just take a perfectly myopic solution to our situation and ruin it. But, but perhaps they'd at least allow me to address the number of judges that get kickbacks from moving more and more black bodies into the privately run prison industrial complex with that order in the court. You were guilty when you got here. You were guilty. You were guilty when my family wanted to be treated to vacations. You were guilty. I hope you brought a toothbrush. You were guilty when my children's college education became too difficult to pay for, pay for, pay for. Now, now back to our regularly scheduled program. Let's let's pray for Black Lives Matter and let's pray for those cops who are not intimidated by the very idea of Black Lives Matter and, and let's pray for the most at-risk, vulnerable, and endangered lives. And then we finish praying. 
Let's practice self-defense, self-determination, self-love, and organize. Okay, so the audience got a touch of this. And I also want to say that this man is the hardest working man in the business. I mean, he's been, he said he's been off key, uh, low key for a while, uh, but you just, I mean, if he could also teach a course on how to accumulate wealth just on the art form, because remember he has an MBA in business, Right. He's a very brilliant, intelligent man. Um, th th people would have to know this. I mean, he has um, music. He produces books. He produces his poetry. Everything is in his name. Right. So even if he were to be able to just give a, co a course on the business aspect of how to profit on 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 your art, it would be something that would be phenomenal and maybe he has done that uh but i just need to the listeners to know this like this is the king of poetry yes i said that i said that right now 2021 <laughs> that okay Lynette. <laughs> i was just looking at his his reaction he's like wow <laughs> it's so true she spoke the truth I was like, you can't live up to that, right? So <laughs> when somebody gives an intro that's like phenomenal and you're you're enjoying the intro from an ego perspective, but in reality, you know, once they finish that intro, ain't no way you're going to live up to that. You know, you almost wish they ain't said nothing. You know? Oh, no, don't say that. That that piece that we just played is phenomenal. And it's, it just, it, it resonates in so many ways. It's like... <laughs> What is up, you know? That sister, uh, Ayana Monet Stanley Jones. Ayana Monet Stanley Jones. She was a young sister who was sleeping on her couch. Uh, and there was a police exercise where, I think it was Chicago, where they, um, they were doing something for one of those cop shows. It wasn't the first 48ers or whatever, but it was a cop show that, that provided them with footage or something like that. And um, they threw a, a, like a little a flash grenade through her window, you know, as part of the show, thinking that they were going to come in and arrest somebody, but the person wasn't there. And that grenade killed her. Mm -hmm. And no one was ever brought to justice for her murder. So that's the poem. It's Ayanna Monet, Stanley Jones. And I brought up Mike Brown and um, Oscar Grant and Freddie Gray and, um, you know, a, a lot of other brothers, um, Bobby Hutton. But to to illustrate that this is something that's timeless, mm -hmm. you know, it's timeless. It's sad. It's it's sad, you know, I'm, that we have to to live through this. We were talking earlier about, you know, how do you talk to young people, and um, it it almost feels like people are on one hand are desensitized by all of you know this and then on the other side it feels like we're triggered it's triggering it's like it's just makes you i don't know it's like paralyzing you know i want i mean for young kids I, I just i'm glad they see what it is when i was younger uh you know they had, they had a movie belly with nas and dmx um god rest his soul god bless the dead uh, and in the movie Belly was like, <laughs> I remember my, my neighbor across the street saying, yo, you seen Belly? I was like, yeah. He was like, man, if there was any justice in the world, that would be an instant Oscar. <laughs> like that, like the Oscar people could even understand what was going on there. But I didn't even understand why they called the movie Belly, you know, in the beginning. And without it being explained, it kind of like got got me over time like they talking about America is the belly of the beast you know what I mean that we're living in like you know the the, the metro in, 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 um, in the metropole of hell you know, almost so I'm glad that they get to see it because I got I was raised off of it mm -hmm. I was raised uh, I went to Chad school I went to uh, programs you know the way my mother uh, raised me because my, my mother and my father split early on 
the way my mother raised me. When I was in school, they were showing us videos of, of white people telling you, you know, if you call yourself a nigga, I'll give you a dollar. You know what I mean? Stuff like that, you know, or like showing us videos of, you know, them putting black baby dolls and white baby dolls in front of young girls and seeing like what they chose and then talking to them about why they chose them. You know, so I was I already knew that I was in a place that I was hating. And urban Essex County, particularly like East Orange was the second blackest city in the, in the country when I grew up, the first being East St. Louis. You know what I mean? So in uh, most of a lot of North, unless you were down there in East Orange, you, you didn't really see a lot of people who weren't black. And um, again, I was raised, uh, you know, coming off of the North Rebellion in 68. I was you know, born in 70, but the organization was still going. I, I'm glad they get to see. I'm glad they get to, because I think there was this whole post-racial myth that was going on back when Obama was president. So I'm glad it's front and center. And yet, and still, you know, I, I would never encourage a young man to, you know, to, to react, to, to do uh, what people hope you do. A lot of things are stochastic. And, and it means just, just you keep putting the situation out there and then statistically something has to happen. So in my opinion, I was talking about like some of the people, like the fathers or whatever, whose children um, met untimely demises and they took it one way, they, you know, because of their religion, because of their inner beliefs. And I respect, you know, however, you know, it moved them. But those cats made the news. I know there's got to be other cats, you know, who things happen to their children. They took it a whole nother way. That ain't going to be that ain't going to be on the news. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. I would just caution young cats to really think, really uh, ask yourself who you are, what your plans are for the future, and take it slow. Don't I, I wouldn't make any moves that I would, you know, that, that you can't back out of or that have consequences that'll end up being something to regret. You know what I mean? So I, I would just say be careful, man. It's, it's, it's all types of people. It's all types of people, you know, and just play play it smart at all times. Know how to move. Thank you for that question. So we're going to uh, let Rain, then Rob Digger is going to have the last question, and then we're going to bring in someone really quickly to say hello to you. Sure. Um, so your piece was very powerful, by the way. Um, I'm a poet myself, so that really resonated. Um, your delivery, everything was very um, moving. Um, but I wanted to know... Uh, do you have like any specific times where like your work um, changed or maybe made an impact on someone? Um, I, I don't know if it's how true it is, but a sister did tell me that they named her grandchild after me. So I guess that was the impact. Um, are you talking about people whose work I influenced or people whose lives I influenced? Lives lives. You know, I say that something I say to myself a lot is that people talk, people don't talk to me, they, people talk about me, but they don't really talk to me, right? So I'm a very interest, I'm a very, I'm an introverted person. Uh, I, I'm very good at seclusion. And I don't like to talk on the phone to almost anyone, you know, almost anyone. And um, so I don't know. People do reach out to me. I do get messages and um, you know, in different social media platforms and emails of, of people who say that they were moved. And that's, that's, I don't necessarily want the accolade. I appreciate it and I'm grateful for it. But I do want to move people, whether I know about it or not. I hope that I've moved far more people than I could ever know about. You know, I know that trying to apply things that I put in poems has improved my life. So I hope that there are things that my poems, I think there are things, I hope that there are things in my poems that have improved other people's lives. There were, there was at one point a couple of cats, and I guess they, they still do. So periodically every year or two, uh, there's, a, there's these couple of cats, young cats who called me just to talk about life. You know, I mean, in one case, I, I remember one of the cats who saw about, he was about to go ballistic. You know, he was back from a tour overseas found out that, you know, his domestic situation wasn't what he thought, and he was about ready to just, you know, just go all out. So I had the opportunity to talk to him. And um, I, I recall a point a, a few years back 
where I used to be online and just look for people who just seemed to kind of be, you know, a little sad because I could relate. You know, I, I know that feeling, even when things all seem to be going right, sometimes, especially when things seem to be going right. You know, you, you, I, I know that feeling. So I hope that I have inspired people indirectly and directly uh, that I don't even know about. And yes, there are a few that I do or who have shared with me that I have inspired. Well, I, I will say real quickly, I, I never talk this much. They will tell you, I just do the little quick and I'm quiet because we I do the producing, stay behind the scenes. But I want to let you know that you inspired uh, me in such a great way. Uh, I'll never forget 2008. We were doing the artist exchange. It got kind of m- messy because of the hurricane. You just made the plane over to Jamaica. It was the first time that... Um, it was the first time, and I was like calling, and it was like, I don't know. He was coming from Florida from another gig. So I was like, I don't know if he's going to make it, but somehow you did. And uh, Muta Baruka, the godfather of the poetry, that was his first time ever performing in the grill. Um, so I met you through Jerry Gant, and I met you on purpose because I was like, Jerry, this poet is like, I need him to come to Jamaica when we come down. And at the time, Jerry was supposed to be there. It was a lot of different mahogany brown. It was a lot of folks that were supposed to be there that helped out in the beginning phases. But that whole thing helped. Uh, at, one, at one time, we were just strictly into doing programming for children. But this that whole program uh, allowed to restrate, reshape what we did to be able to do what we're doing uh, right now, interviewing people like you, Rod Digga, uh, Oscar, Peabody Award winners, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like it has moved even the poets that were in Jamaica helped uh, organize a museum that is now in Montego Bay. So you are very, your words are so inspirational. Um, your life, I mean, HBO, it, it needs to be told, even though you don't like to talk and be bothered with people, but your life needs to be, um, it needs to be on camera because it, it's just, a, you are amazing. I will say this. And I also want to say I'm enjoying uh, the things that you're doing with your queen online too. That is just making me very happy, but I'm gonna let Rod Digger uh, talk. I never usually do this much talking, but go ahead. <laughs> I just want to tell you one thing. I mean, you, you in, in, in the brief things that you just said, you brought so many thoughts to mind. But one thing I want to tell you in particular, because it comes up in other contexts, but this is the proper context for it. So it could be even more, that much more interesting. I was, I was in Miami, I had done a show in Miami. And I was um, flying there, right? I think I did a show in Miami. I know I was flying there from Miami. So it could have been a connecting flight, but I'm pretty sure I had just done a show in Miami. And I was coming to you, to Jamaica. And um, I was in the waiting area, you know, the, the, the gate at the flight to come to Jamaica. And there was a storm. So the flight was a little bit delayed to get there, right? But to, to, to take off. And there was all these white cats around me, you know, like just all these white cats going to Jamaica and me, I'm sitting right in the middle of it. And I'm waiting, the, the flight is delayed. They say it's gonna go, it's gonna take off, it's gonna take off, don't worry about it. Just, you know, wait and we'll let you know when the board. Next thing I knew, I woke up. So I fell asleep sitting at the gate, right? Everybody was gone when I woke up. <laughs> Everybody was gone. And what was so wild to me is I would never do that to somebody. So all those white cats got up and got on that plane. Nobody tapped me or tried to wake me up or let me know. And they all left. And somehow I found that I was able to get another flight to get to you. But that's what happened. We I never knew all that part. That's amazing. (laughs) But we didn't know. We were just like, you know, the hurricane. So we were we weren't. We didn't know what to expect because of the fact that that hurricane was happening and it did happen. We did have to postpone the show until I believe a Sunday, but just that whole movement re how we were moving as artists 
So you are so inspirational. Um, I'm gonna let Ra speak. Sounds like you have a stand. <laughs> Be quiet, Rocket. <laughs> Somebody sounds like a fan. Oh, oh, that is so cute. Okay, no. Um, no, here's a here's a, a really serious question because um as, as, okay. As of lately, I've been seeing a lot of pushback from the parents of of slain victims uh killed by police uh just recently. Tamir Rice's mother spoke out against Tamika Mallory and, and, a, and a few other celebrities and and um, maybe even Mike Brown's father. I, I can't confirm or deny comments he made specifically, but but definitely uh, Tamir Rice's mother uh, spoke out after the Grammys. And, you know, I'm one of those people where I try not to you know, I, I, I try to keep my thoughts and opinions to myself, especially when it comes to like the grieving process. You know, I don't like to pass judgment, it, things like that. But what do you like? What is a nice way to convey to parents that uh, or or actually, let me ask you this. Do you do you feel that it's exploitative or performative when when artists do this because you have you know you have folks that get mad when celebrities don't use their platform but then they get mad when they do so I'm kind of like on the fence when it comes to speaking out about certain issues and things well how, how what, what would you uh speak to that a little bit I, I would say speak your piece uh, as long as you are respectful as long as you would do it in a way that you wouldn't be offended if someone, if you if the shoe was on the other foot. Um, I, I want to be real careful in how I characterize this, but unfortunately, sometimes when, when that happens, when some of these people lose a loved one, uh, they get thrust into a certain limelight. And um, that in it of itself, because I've seen it, and I've seen, um, I've seen a person who lost a child uh, you know, negotiate a speaking rate, <laughs> you know, with an organization or a college and, you know, a, you know, mm -hmm. a rate. and I, I think to myself, like how, how miserable uh, it would have to be to live your life, you know, like how, how some people are famous for a sex tape, right? <laughs> like how, right. How, how unfortunate it would be to live your life being a celebrity, uh, for lack of a better word, because of, of, a, of a tragic loss because you lost mm -hmm. a child. And um, I, I don't even want to dabble in it because I've okay. seen it. I've seen, I've seen, it's, it's kind of like, we're, we're, imagine like the, the death of a child could become your brand and then you're protecting that. And that's crazy, you know, right. it's crazy. I mean, I think what we need to do in, in that case, really, is go back to Mega Evans and look at how his mother responded to different people and, and what they had to say in, in, in terms of her son's death and how she carried it, because that's probably the prototype right there. You know, my understanding of her story, everything she did for the community, you know, mm. she, she, she had the open, the open casket funeral. She had a let Ebony and Jet come and put and take the pictures and, and, and put it out there, you know, globally. Um, to me, that's like the prototype. A lot of things that are happening now, man, especially with like our culture and the social media and the influencers, or whatever, sadly, it can spill over to some of those situations and people's livelihood becomes their identification with what happened to someone that they loved. But then that's all they have left. And I've never had that loss. And I don't want to uh, judge or mischaracterize it, but I have seen the, 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 the someone negotiating, like, you know, like my speaking fee for talking about my son's passing to an organization. And it just seems so weird to me. Word. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been just having, I don't know, I've been having some thoughts, just kind of analyzing things going on, like, hmm, that's, that's peculiar, but I, I know, you know, I never want to, you know, I never want to be disrespectful. So I'm just like, okay, I'm going to just, 
I'm just gonna keep that. So, see how that plays out. I try to mind my business too. You know, I try to mind my business too. And um, yeah, I mean that that would be tragic. You know, I remember recently when Rihanna was trying to speak out about the farmers in India who were protesting, and then you had other people who were activists in India saying, telling her to stay in her place and mind her business. And I'm sure she was doing it from a place of of sincerity and authenticity. Well, I'm not sure, but I believe she was. You know, so it would seem almost like a smack in the face to see somebody who could provide a whole lot more uh, light onto your subject, a lot more. And you're upset about, yeah. You know? Exactly. That that that's that's really how I feel. I feel like this would have come and gone in the news like every other assassination of our young kings had celebrities not been speaking out. Whether you know performative be as it may, the you know the ends justify the means. I think it's so. keeping you know it's keeping the conversation going. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I would like to think that it's, you know, it's forcing our politicians to do things. They're, they're taking baby steps. I know they're focused on Asian oppression right now, but, uh, but we'll, uh, you know, we, we, we will get there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I wanted to see if you had any last thoughts and- I also wanted to get both of your um, executioner says, huh? <laughs> oh no, Ooh, that sounds bad. Okay, <laughs> but any, any other thoughts? Anything Terminal. else you'd like to share with us? I, I really want to also kind of throw this in there, and I, I guess everybody can kind of t- talk about it. But um, you know, hip hop lost a legend, and I would love to get some feedback on your thoughts on DMX and. Uh, I, was, I was talking about DMX the other day. I have never met him to my recollection. And, and the reason that I say that is because I grew up right in the same general area. Right? I spent a lot of time in the castle, which was a club, a hip hop club in the South Bronx. So who knows? You know, we was in, in, in opposite stalls in the bathroom, whatever. But I don't know. You know, we may have passed each other, you know. But um, the thing I remember most about him is uh, the first time I heard a radio interview of him before he was popular or famous, whatever. He, just, you know, he was just kind of coming out. He was on that LL record, I think. And they were interviewing him, and, they, and one of the interview questions was, who's your favorite MC, Biggie or Pac? And he was like, I don't know. All I know was I'm the best that ever did it. And I just was like, oh. Like, I, it just hit me. I was like, can you say that? You know what I mean? And he, it's one of those soundtrack to my life things. So he laid a lot of music that um, when I hear it, it takes me back to certain moments. So when I hear um, Rough Riders Anthem, it really takes me back to a certain crew um, that, you know, uh, of us that was together at that time that just would wild out. Like, you know, like if that song came on and we was in the club or in the bar or even if we was in the car, it was like a mosh pit. It was crazy. Like we was that cool. It, it was just, man, and to this day, every time I hear that song, you know, I just... It, it makes it, it just gives me joy, right? Because I connected to a time when you know the crew was just large and happy and wild, you know what I mean? And that song, you know, more than any other song at the time, you know, would set us off. And a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff about him, uh, it, it hits me so hard. I spent a lot of time in Baltimore. I lived in Baltimore for um, almost a decade, I think. And, and I know that, I know what that's about. So I just really, I didn't even know he was born there. I knew that he left Yonkers and went there for a time to, to recuperate, regenerate when he needed to. But I didn't know it was because his family was there. But I mean, I don't know, he just seemed like somebody, even, even from the wild stuff that I know about him, he seemed like somebody, you know, that, that I could have dug, you know, I would have dug if I had known, but I didn't. I only knew his music and his music Man, it was, again, it's a soundtrack to my life sort of thing. There's certain songs that is you play. I mean, it's certain songs. I'm laughing because I'm thinking about women quoting some of the stuff, you know, some of the most, you know, masculine lyrics that he said, but seeing women like doing them like real hard, you know? (laughs) So I have recollections of that too. So I I just, I don't know, that that hit me hard. I I was reading it with my eyes watering and, you know, asking myself if I was crying or not. So there's that. Wow. 
Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for being here. Anybody else want to jump in? Um, I know we're waiting for his surprise. <laughs> uh, he said that he's uh, logging in and nothing's happening. Oh. Well, I have a great DMX story to share in the meantime while y'all work, work it out. Yeah. Um, so incidentally, DMX and I share the same birthday. We were birth both born December 18th. And one particular year, we were both celebrating. We were celebrating separately. I had never met him officially, but he was in one corner and I was in another corner. We were staying at the same hotel and we were in L.A., and two o'clock comes, you know, everybody knows about L.A. The party is over 2 a.m. sharp. So I'm not finished partying. And apparently neither was DMX. We like, wait a minute. It's still our birthday. <laughs> so so now that we, we're recognizing that it's each other's birthday and we still want to party. He's like, oh, well, shit, we could continue to party. Let's go upstairs to my room and finish partying. And I kind of gave him a look like, come again? <laughs> and he was like, oh, no, 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 not like that, not like that. No, my, my wife is in the room, my kids, they, I'm like, oh, all right, okay, okay. So so we go up, and at, at the time, he was married to um, to Shira, and I, and I met her, and, um, and we ended up just laughing and talking. I feel bad, because I'm like, oh, we just drinking and smoking. But we stayed up. I think I didn't leave his room till like the next day. Like we talked for hours. When I say, like everybody says like, yo, that's the realest person you ever met. Like I really, really feel in my heart that like DMX is probably, if not one of the realest uh, artists that has ever <laughs> grace this industry I mean he just dropped so many gems on me like I was able like he was you know he got vulnerable I got vulnerable like I shared some of my insecurities with him he shared some of his with me now mind you this is our first time meeting but you know the the the, the liquor is the truth serum so it's like we just talking and talking and yo I left that room like yo I think I just made a new friend like DMX I, I, I think I can call DMX my friend <laughs> so that that was that was that was so great and and ever since then like any Anytime I cross paths with him subsequent to that, it was like, Digga, what up? Like, you know, he made his way to acknowledge me and recognize me. And I was just, you know, I was just forever so grateful for that. That's that's fresh. That's fresh. Well, very good. So um, this has been a real cool experience. I'm so happy that we had this time together. <laughs> that's <laughs> I'm so um, lucky that we have this time together too. Um, <laughs> um, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the welcome. I'm assuming the person didn't have um, the person wasn't able to make the call or they can't connect. How? What was it? What was the time for our call? When is this supposed to end? Um, let's see. Tinu will be able to tell us that. I think she must be on. He's the trying to come in back again. He's trying oh. to come back in. Oh, okay, okay. How, what time was it supposed to end? We're, if, this is it, and then we're wrapping up. How many more minutes do we have? Uh, we got about five more minutes. While we're waiting for him to join, could I do a 90 second poem or two minute poem? What? Yes. Yeah. All right, Rodrigo, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. You could tease me. <laughs> okay. I can tell where your scars are just by the way you walk. And every assault that you have endured has ensured your every step. And you are blessed regardless of the animals that have attacked you. And you are pure no matter who has abused you. I know an angel when I see one. And when our kingdom come, it will be you, I, and the son. And we'll be one. We'll create children. And our children will create us. Then every night by the light of the moon, I will kiss away your scars to Abby Lincoln tones. And I will drink perfume that tastes like you out of a vessel with a waist like you. Then I will draw our bath water warm so we can soak until our souls are reborn. And you will be safe and secure in my arms and it will always be this way. 
See, I can tell where your scars are just by the way you smile. And every night I walk a mile in your shoes, kiss away your tears and compile your blues to we choose to get sexy with Robert Johnson and Bessie Smith. And I will lick every bit from your soul's revelation to your pain's exodus. And when there's nothing left to sip, I'll massage the tension from your nakedness and then lift you in the most effortless way so you can just slowly ride all your pain away. And you should know they, they couldn't create a mirror that could begin to show you half the things that I see in you because more important than your face and your shape, I'm in love with the woman you're becoming. And I can foresee a day where your hair is mostly gray and your smile shows intensely and no one can look in your eyes without seeing decades of wisdom. And I'm not concerned with the woman of the year because I'm in love with the bride of a lifetime. And I don't want to watch your figure. I'd rather watch you use your left and right mind. And I'm in love with your laugh more than the tightness of your abs. And though a mirror can show you your present, I'm obsessed with our future and our past. And my love lasts because it has the benefit of knowing that to truly be intimate, I don't focus on the qualities you have now. Instead, I focus on the qualities you have that are infinite. And that should be the sentiment that takes us all around the world to ocean liners and beaches and hotels and far beaches where we use stolen glances to communicate our secrets. And I hope our love is the one that teaches couples how to share their lives and men not to compare their wives with what seems greener on the other side and I'll confide in you nightly then provide for you daily then in between do the best that I can to treat my fellow man fairly but it's most important I'll be that eternal flame that brings you heat whenever you're cold and you'll always see yourself clearer in me than any mirror because I'm a pure reflection of your soul that's that poem Ow, ow. I'm digging that Audrey Lord. Lord. Nice. Thank you. And I'm digging that Audrey Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going back to 2008. 2008. uh, We had Rod Digger's uh, daughter at our program that summer, right? 2008. This brother right here bought his. At that time, his is soon to be fiance, soon to be wife to Jamaica, Ali, yeah. brother Ali. We're we're going back to Jamaica right here, brother <laughs> Salam AC. <laughs> you know, you know me, and Ali. We Ali and I met on your on your trip, and um, and we we've somewhat kept in contact since then. You know what I mean? Uh, we yeah. got. We don't talk frequently, but I don't talk to anyone frequently, right? But we we were just talking, uh, what about a month ago or so? Five months. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and you were you were great as usual, man. I mean, I've always been a fan. I mean, we share the same high school, kind of, sorta, because you know, me and Father Ed, we had a little fist to cuff and I had to leave St. Benedict's. <laughs> you know, you know, JC. <laughs> yeah, is that who JC? Yeah, John Cox, do you know him? You don't know him? Okay. I know the name. I do recognize him. So you I do re- I do remember that name. Okay. That's what's yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, you know, me and Mark Stevens, you know, we were in the same class, same group, Dwyer. And then I left and I went to the public school system or whatever. Then me and Mark kind of hooked up again at Johnson C. Smith University. Um and then we wind up pledging out for together the whole nine and whatever. And I still keep in contact with him. Um, Mark but, Stevens? Yeah, Mark Stevens. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Mark Stevens, man. Plus, also, Brother Kenyatta wanted me to, I, I, I got to send this thing to you because he wants to send you the video. It was okay. beautiful. Man. That that was, I mean, it was impromptu, man, but it was, it was really beautiful to be a part of, just to kind of let everybody know what was going on. There's a rights of passage program in Newark. It's called the, the Step Rights of Passage program for young boys. Striving together equals progress. And so maybe a week prior, I asked Talam to, to perform a couple of his, his, his poems. And at the same time, it was Sister Zul. If anybody is from the Essex County area, Newark area, you know who Sister Zul Latif is. And um, it was just beautiful, man. It was, it, was, it was a really beautiful event, man. And um, it's on tape. They, um, Brother Kenyatta said it's on tape, so I'll try to find I guess I got to get your email and everything to send it to you, man. But um, again, man, thank you. Thank you for, for doing it. And I appreciate it. I mean, it was last minute and you came through, man, and, and you lit a fire. So 
Much appreciated. Much appreciated, fam. And I, I really enjoyed it. And I thank you for asking me to do it. And I promise you, um, pretty much everything, if not everything I do right now, I only do it because of, of who's asking or the energy. Other than that, I, I don't really be interested. You I appreciate I mean? it, man. Um, and, and I know that wasn't proper English. You know, I don't really be interested, but sometimes I don't want to say it, you know, like with the right impact and uh, absolutely. And <laughs> it's, it's the linguistics of those African vestiges that were that were a once a part of our language, man. And we still got it. It's a part of our DNA. It is what it is. Indeed, like, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> so we're so. This was your little surprise here, brother Talam AC. Um, and we know that you, you do the work. Um, we want to thank you so much. We're going to end the show. I never, ever do this much talking. Rain and Lene can tell you and Digger okay. too, because Digger every now and then comes on the show. So, um, we want to so, thank you so much to Lam AC. Give me, give me we wanna... just give me, could you give me five seconds just to like, cause I don't know. I, I've been in places where people would know who I am. Matter of fact, I was with a girl one time, six months and then six months into relationship. She told me she knew who I was before we even met. So like, <laughs> I don't like that whole not give people their flowers thing. It's it's creepy. So just for my, for my digger's sake, I, I recognize and I know that I'm talking to one of the top MCs of my lifetime. So I just want to be Indeed. clear about that, that I'm not confused. Oh, Indeed. Uh -huh. Indeed. Indeed. Yes, this is Rod Digger, the, the MC Rod Digger. Right. Thank you so much. I yes. 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 See. Radiga, she, let me tell you about this sister. She is very conscious. That's why I vibe with this one. I love her. She never tells me no. Uh, we first met through her daughter coming to the program that I've uh, put together, facilitated, co-founded. Co and I, I, I love this sister. I love her. She is my sister. So I'm, I'm very happy and I'm glad that she came on because I was like, you know, she wasn't as familiar, but I'm hoping that this connection, I really want her to bring you on her show that she has. I'm going to send her all your information. I'm going to send some links of some poems and stuff. I, I really want that connection to happen. So I want to thank you so, so much, Ra, for coming in here, um, Dirty Harriet. Okay, so um, <laughs> AKA, we could go on and on, Digga. Um, yeah, she said, uh, she was talking about DMX's wife. I think she said Tashira. And the first thing I thought about was her, her lyric, you know, first name Rashia. You know what I mean? So <laughs> that's how I follow it. That's how I follow it. Uh, yes. No doubt. Yes. No doubt. So, we want to thank you so, so much, Brother Talam AC. Um, we want to thank you, Brother uh, Ali, for coming on. Uh, our two jewels, uh, diamonds, everything, Lene and Rain, thank you so much. And Rod Digga Digga, thank you First so name, much. I see you. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Rod, I hope next Thursday you can make the meeting that we're having uh, for Matula. Um, so, we thank you so much. We love you. And Talam, any last words? We're going to put all the information people need to go and find. Go online, talamac.com. We're going to put down some of the books and some of the poetry, some of the things that people can be able to buy, put the links on it. Any last words, Brother Talam AC? We love you. And you're in a good place. I'm looking at everything about you. LA is. You know, California is doing you very, very well. And I that's, saw that beautiful, I'm, your beautiful I'm queen. Place, I'm, I'm trying to buy a place in Atlanta. So you know, I might she be moving so to Atlanta. So, um, okay. Um, they, they living too well out there for like, you know, fractions of what it costs to live here. So I, yes. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Word up. Um, and your beautiful queen too. All of that magic, all that happiness going on down there. We're so happy for you. I'm really, really happy for you. You don't even know. You know what I'm saying? You don't even know. So we love you. Any last words? No, just to new Lin uh, Lene, Rain, Radiga, Ali. I just really appreciate the welcome. I appreciate the energy that y'all that y'all provided that made it so easy for me to be myself. I wasn't. I didn't know what to expect, and I can clam up. You know, uh, sometimes I don't talk as much, but y'all, y'all fixed that. Y'all made me feel at home. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 
That's Thank you up. so much. Thank you so much for listening. I want to make sure that you tune in to Rod Digger's show. Tune in to Brother Ali McBride. Every now and then he puts something on the African diaspora. We want to thank you so much, Lene and Rain. And make sure you all go to talamac.com. We will put all the information down on how you can get this brother's work, iconic brother's work. Um, thank you so much. I mean, we could have gone on and on to talk about what you've done. And um, we hope that Ra, um, I'm going to give Ra Digger the information and she has you on their show during this Absolutely. month of poetry, poetry month, Ra. Make there's, that a happen. Market, there's a market for niggas. Oh. <laughs> That's what you need to let her hear. If she doesn't hear anything else, listen to that poem. It's in the, the beginning of a documentary that came on. I forget. I think it was about the sister, Cynthia McKinney. But there's a mm. poem at the beginning of that. And um, I think you did. Yes, yeah, you're, you're mixing up two things. That, that, that was called What Black Men Think. That one was okay. called What Black Men Think. Yeah. I well, think I'm you mixed up. There's a market it. for, for <laughs> niggas. They, it, the whole world needs to hear that. I'm telling you. Word. That's oh. my two cents. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> can you also get me the link to this so I can share it? If yes, we will. We will send it you the link to to this, and okay. um, we just love brother uh, Ali and <laughs> Lene. Lene loves you extra with some hot <laughs> sauce on you, some hot <laughs> sauce on you. Okay, so we love everyone. We love you. One, one, one. Lots of kisses, lots of love, lots of hugs. Salam AC. Make sure you get out there and it's all streaming on all different types of platforms to buy. Support him. The money goes straight to him. He is a business mogul. I'm telling you, you need to give that class. I'm saying, I'm telling you, you need to. I, I have some stories to talk about. Uh, with how he does his business, but um, I'm going to mind my business. Uh, so we're going to end. We're going to end the show. We want to thank everyone uh, for listening. Uh, thank you so much. You're listening to WB the ICAP Radio Show on WBCR Bluefield College in partnership with Montclair Film and North Arts. Uh, we want you to make sure that you tune in next Wednesday. Thank you all for listening. We love you. We love you all. Thank you. Peace. Let it shine. Let it shine. Everybody say, let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Talk to them, Lou. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine, shine. Let it shine, let it shine, shine. Talk to all day. Shine, 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 shine.